Joining us, our first political panel of the day, David Gillespie from the National Party, Graham Perrett from Labor. Thanks both for your time. Cheers. Thanks very much for having Glad us on. Why don't we begin with what's happened over the uh, so-called sports rort scandal, because the defence from the Prime Minister was here was a simple one. What he always went back to was there were no ineligible grants. That's now wrong. Uh, I'll just correct the record there, Tom. Uh, none of the grants that were awarded were ineligible. In the total, other, uh, other grants that came in as applica uh, other applications that came in were deemed ineligible, but all the uh, grants that were uh, delivered were eligible, and that was confirmed last night in Senate estimates. Uh, Senator Canavan asked Mr Boyd a follow-up question, uh, and all the grants that were uh, delivered and awarded were eligible. They, if there were 43% that were ineligible, they weren't any of the ones that were awarded. Money was awarded to, to grants that had come in late, though. That, just by virtue of the fact they came in late, didn't make them eligible. Look, that is a technicality. Um, there is... <laughs> but it's eligibility. They, technicality. They get, the they, guidelines. They get analysed, Graham, as you know. Um, you know, departments and statutory authorities are asked for their advice. Uh, ministers take that advice. Uh, Minister McKenzie took mm. their advice, but she also, their advice. she also takes the advice of people like you and I that make representations on behalf of uh, our constituents. But and, and ultimately, uh, as the Attorney General said and as the uh, National Audit Officer said, the Minister had, by the guidelines, the right to make discretionary choices. That's not what choices. the Audit Officer said. Pardon? The Audit Office did not say she had that right. They questioned the legality of it. That's well, what the report that's said. That, well, they did question it, but it has been sent to the Attorney-General, and the Attorney-General is of the... We, have, well, we haven't had that advice released, but you just said the Audit Office found that she had that right. That's not what they found. They questioned whether or not it was legal. That's where we're at with the Audit Office. Well, the Audit Office themselves last night said that uh, no grants that were delivered were ineligible. There were obviously others that were ineligible, but they were none of the ones that were um, delivered or awarded. It's been a really popular uh, program with all the recipients in Labor seats, in national seats, in Liberal seats, because communities do rely on um, help. I just want to go to that again. The Audit Office last night did say that grants that were funded were not eligible. That's what they said last 43 night. 43 of them. Yeah, and that, uh, no, well, that is a bit of sophistry on their part. Uh, oh, there what, on the, from the audit office? <laughs> the audit office. Well, yeah. look, there was a follow-up question from Senator Canavan at the same meeting, and he sought clarification from the, Mr Boyd from the uh, National Audit Office, and he said, was there any award, uh, was there any grant that was awarded that was ineligible? And Mr Boyd himself said, no, they were all eligible. But if you look, there were many more applications than there were funds and grants available. And so that's why there is a process he, that, here's, that here's what he said. This better. is important. I just want to say this. So Boyd explained this meant that no projects that had been assessed as ineligible by Sport Australia were granted funding, but ineligible projects were funded due to Mackenzie accepting late applications. So they didn't oh. assess them and find them they were ineligible, but that... There were grants that were ineligible that were given money. According that's to your important. guidelines, that, that's what, according that's to your what government's that's guidelines. The, the, mini the minister, by the guidelines, had the right to make decisions um, but we're, about we're, it. Hang on, and, we're talking about an eligibility here. So what you said before, there was no funding given out to projects that were, not ineligible, that were ineligible, that's wrong. Well, that's the, the words of... I sought advice from um, the hearings last night and Senator Canavan asked that follow-up question after... Um, uh, Senator Betts' comments and he sought clarification from Mr Boyd from the National Audit Office and uh, I can't um, see how if he said no grants uh, were ineligible, um, no grants that were awarded were ineligible, is anything other than what has already well, been said. Well do you think I would really pass muster with any voter the idea that the Minister can just swoop in and decide that deadlines don't matter for the projects she thinks suits her? Look, the minister, ministers have discretion over lots of things. In the Labor Party, when they were in government, ministers had discretion. In the future, just say the Labor Party is in power again, I'm sure they will defend the right for ministers to have discretion over uh, guidelines and uh, uh, policies. That's why they're there. We have a Westminster system. Otherwise, you yeah, just outsource government um, to but unelected but officials. But, David, the, the Westminster system suggests that it's a level playing field for all 151 electorates. 
Mm. But we've, we've actually seen, you know, we, we accept that. We want a level playing field. But suddenly we find out that the minister has completely distorted things. Australians believe in a fair go, and I'm not saying that the sporting clubs that got it aren't deserving. I'm saying that, that it should have been done on merit. Mm. That Your guidelines talked about merit. Your guidelines talked about deadlines and people being able to go in the process. That's not fair. It's just not fair uh, to have a minister step in and treat it like a, a, an election pork barrel process rather than an efficient, proper use of taxpayers' monies. That's what good government does. Mm. And the first thing... Uh, and I'm sorry that you're here now because the first thing that Prime Minister Morrison should do today is go out and apologise to the Australian people and then move on with something to somehow make a mess, make up for this mess and sort it out. But the first thing he should do is apologise. And it's tough for you to be left swinging in the wind after that evidence that was given by the Audit Office last night. Prime Minister Morrison's got a job to do and that's to apologise to the Australian people and then sort this mess out. Yeah. I'll just reply to that, Graham. As I said, Senator Canavan gave a, a follow-up question to the officer from the National Audit Office and he confirmed what Bridget... David, this is said. weasel words on weasel words. You're better than that. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's tough that you're here at this time after lo last night's damning evidence. And I do commend Senator Betts for that forensic questioning that he did on behalf of the Australian people. Obviously, he was focused on the national interest rather than the nationals' interest. But let's move on and let the Prime Minister apologise to the Australian people and go to those mums and dads that took the time to put in the, the submissions for their sporting clubs, deserving sporting clubs, and uh, let's get them properly sorted out uh, the way a good government would operate. I think uh, everyone who's received funds, every sporting group... Um, is very pleased with the program. I know in my electorate... The ones that didn't, though. I just want to pick you up on this bit, too. So the guidelines eligibility requirements don't end just when you've lobbed the application. That's common across many grants programs. That's what the Auditor-General said. Mm. That's what he's getting at here. There were funds given as a result of that element of the requirements that were ineligible. That's what the Auditor-General is saying. Well, uh, I... I can only go on what is on the record in his subsequent answers to questions from Senator Canavan. And, uh, you know, he said it. There were no grants that were ineligible that were awarded. There were obviously some that weren't eligible, um, that didn't receive it, but they were all deemed by the original um, Audit Office report and by his subsequent um, reply to Senator Canavan last night, and that's all I can go on. And you can, as Graham said, you can try and take things out of context, which the first response appears to be. Um, I think everyone who received it uh, got really great value for their club or their organisation. Um, you can't unmake them. That's uh, not in dispute, David. Yeah. It, that, that, as I said... It's about a proper process. A government process should respect uh, the guidelines and the proper use of taxpayer money rather than this arbitrary... You know, we, we, we had evidence last night that there's been emails back and forth between Prime Minister Morrison's office and uh, Minister, Mo uh, Minister McKenzie's office, you know, working on this these um, colour-coded, working out some sort of system based on how they can best win a, I will point the out election. evidence last night the, Audit, uh, the Auditor General saying that didn't form a significant part of the investigation because it wasn't seen as a primary factor in terms of the Prime Minister's involvement. Uh, look, I want to get to a couple more topics. Yep. The Otis Group, Graham Perrett, they're basically saying they're worried Anthony Albanese will go too far on climate change. Your thoughts? Uh, look, I, I've got to say, I, um, I think I'm a member of the, uh, the La Cantina Group, or the La Cantonistas, I think we might call ourselves, because we went out for dinner last night. Oh, and on the other night, I went to the Monica Steakhouse, so I guess that's another group I'm part of. So I'm not part of the Otis group, which is really just a group of Labor MPs having dinner, let's be honest. Uh, it's not unusual for MPs to get together and have dinner. I've even had dinner with people from the, the, uh, the uh, government, but that doesn't mean that we're forming a political group. People have dinner in Canberra, that happens. Well, it's not the forming of a political group, it's the fact they are all the member of the same faction and they clearly were raising issues that they had with the climate policy of the government, of the opposition leader, sorry, and 
that's obviously been enough of a concern that he called Joel Fitzgibbon to his office to ask about it. Surely that's it's not a settled issue within Labor. Uh, look, there'll always be debates about policy. Uh, I, heaven forbid that we have a party where you can't debate issues. Uh, but that I think it's a bit of a beat-up to say that politicians having dinner together means, mm. you know, a, a palace coups on the way. That's ridiculous. People have dinner all the time in Canberra. You, you can, and it's hardly a secret meeting if you're sitting in a restaurant in Canberra, as you know. Uh, that's not where you have... Uh, you know, you go off to Queenby and uh, I, I think is what, how it was done. Well, the first the, the one last was a private yeah. room at Kokomo's. Uh, so right. that is, there is a bit of privacy <laughs> yeah. there. So that was all right, well, it, thanks for the heads up. OK. We're not talking about choice of dining venue. We're talking about not a, maybe a palace coup, but certainly a policy coup. There are sensible people in the Labor Party who support uh, the reality that Australia runs still on coal. We export coal. Uh, we need a reliable baseload power. That means power that is in the electrical wires, the distribution system, running at 240 volts at the right frequency, available all the time for industry, like people at Tomago Smelter, who all, many of them live in my electorate, like the other smelters around the country, like businesses that are manufacturing steel, aluminium fabrication, um, you know, processing minerals, all the uh, food processing, all these things, abattoirs, everything is energy dense in a modern industrial world. And unless we've got a replacement for our um, current fleet of coal-fired power stations, um, we will run short of energy. It's Alan Finkel already. says it's gas. Do you agree? Well, gas is a viable uh, replacement, sure. But look, technology can also deliver um, uh, the reduction in greenhouse gases that everyone wants to achieve. If we just put a modern um, ultra-supercritical, uh, highly efficient, low-emission coal-fired power right. station, you can reduce the carbon output of that plant by 43%, uh, which is much bigger than what our current uh, targets are. Even, you know, it's sort of like saying you should never buy a diesel truck because in 1950 and 1960 they used to belch out all this black stuff. Mm. Well, technology has moved on. Um, now you have diesel trucks, you know, common rail technology, uh, they're ultra pure exhaust. Same with coal fired power stations. The Japanese are building them, the Indians are building them, the Europeans are building them. Uh, technology is the answer. That's what the Prime Minister was going on about. Gas does uh, burning gas to produce heat, to run the turbines to produce electricity, there is less carbon. Um, output as a okay. result of gas. Yeah, so it so is a we beneficial... We have a limited amount of time here with this yeah. panel, so it would be remiss if we didn't get to one topic, and that's yeah. unsettled leadership within the Nationals. Are we supposed to believe Barnaby Joyce is really happy to sit on the back bench, let Michael McCormack take the lead when he's doing this podcast with Matt Canavan? Matt Canavan's been speaking quite a bit, and it seems like there really is just unsettled direction within the Nationals. Well, look, we have had a, um, a tumultuous week, a lot of turmoil, um, We've had the spill, the leadership issue um, was decided and um, we are all concentrating on what we're sent here to do. Um, but the thing in the Nationals, unlike the Labor Party or the Liberal Party, we do uh, afford members the ability to speak their mind. And so if someone wants to go and have podcasts, go right ahead. That's the beauty of the Nationals. We are very democratic. Uh, Michael won the leadership, so he is the leader. We're supporting him. As I said in this studio yesterday, we've all had lunch together. Um, but if Matt and Barnaby uh, and me, for instance, if I want to argue a case in the public square, I will go and do it. That's the beauty of the Nats. We, We're not muzzled never, yeah, like okay. the Labor Party is or sent to Siberia. Um, if you don't go with what your faction says you have to say. Did you vote for Lou O'Brien in the deputy speaker oh, contest? I supported Lou in that vote, yes. because Why? Well, you know, the night before he just left our party, Tom. As I said, I am trying to keep our party unified. Um, Lou is a great guy. He was a, a You must great have known it would destabilise Michael McCormack, though. Well, look, I was disappointed, like Matt said and like others said, like Barnaby said, um, that issue has bubbled in the last parliament and this parliament. Uh, we all knew Lou has very, been very frustrated uh, with the way things have been turning out, and uh, he reserved his right. I, I must well, admit, nice he sprang it. That, he, he sprang that harmony it on moment because we both voted for him, David. So that's good to see. <laughs> yeah. Why is that giving into a tantrum, though, to say, "Oh, I needed to keep him in the party, so I voted for him for, to be one of our leaders"? When uh, he's chucking look, a tantrum, trying to quit. No, look, he he had left the party. 
uh, that changes the dynamic considerably. Yeah, it doesn't uh, make as you As you probably know, in, inside the party, I, I was keen for that role. I mean, but I withdrew because obviously um, Lou um, needs to be kept occupied with us. Uh, he has publicly stood in the chamber and said he remains in the LNP, which is his party, but he's chosen to sit outside the Nationals, but he's firmly in government and he is now doing a great job being a Deputy Speaker. So I've been supporting him. I caught up with him for a drink at the end of the day yesterday. Right. He's a great guy and I fully support Maybe. him. Maybe you know how to get a promotion in the Nats then. <laughs> well, the precedent was set. Uh, the former Deputy Speaker actually crossed the floor and sat on the cross benches in the Kevin last Hogan, parliament. Indeed. Well, there you so go. it did so set the preset. This is right. nothing new. <laughs> He's the poor, the poor man's Peter Slipper, is he? The... Pardon? He's the poor man's Peter Slipper. Is that what you're <laughs> you don't want to uh, bring yeah. him up, surely, do you? <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to try. Well, people have left government before and um, uh, to, to be, for the right. trappings of, of high office. Well, if anyone uh, isn't aware of the history, Google Peter Slipper and, <laughs> and Labor as well. There's a bit there. Graham Parrott, David Gillespie, thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, guys.